Thank you. Thank you, Adria. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to come and give this talk. Uh, I wish we could be doing this in person. Uh, you know, talks via, uh, via the internet are okay, but it doesn't really... It doesn't really match the experience of having a live audience and me, you know, being live with you. So, um, so we'll have to bear with that. And hopefully one day in the future, we can do this live. Of course, the advantage is that I don't need to leave my home and I can do it from here and you guys don't need to leave your homes and uh, uh, we can get an audience from all over Mexico and technically by video from all over the world. Uh, so... If you think about if you think about finance, we think about bankers, we think about Wall Street, we think about uh, you know capital markets, financial markets, in any respect. These markets, these financiers, have always, throughout history, been viewed as the ultimate villains, the bad guys, the people who cause economic crises, the people who exploit. Others, the so-called productive people out there, that bankers are just paper shufflers, financiers are just paper shufflers. Really, since Jesus threw them out of the temple 2,000 plus years ago, financiers have been the villains throughout. If you've ever read Dante's Inferno, in uh, where he describes kind of the different rungs of hell, then the moneylender the financier of the time, the banker of the time, is on the seventh rung of hell with a bag of money tied around his neck, a, a bag of gold, and the gold is heavy. So it's pushing him down towards the fire. He's in hell. There's no way a banker could be in heaven. One of the great villains of Shakespeare is Shylock, the moneylender. The moneylender who dares to charge interest on the loans that he gives. And by charging interest on the loans, by definition, is bad, evil, condemnable, a despicable character that nobody wants to have anything to do with. Throughout history, financiers, moneylenders, bankers has been portrayed as evil, villainous, scheming, right? Most conspiracy theories about taking over the world and controlling the world and, and exploiting people place bankers at the center of those conspiracy theories. And of course, today, if you look in the United States at least, and I'm sure this is true in Mexico because it's true everywhere in the world, if we look at our markets, if we look at our regulations, there is no industry in the world out there more regulated, more controlled, more controlled by government than finance. Uh, every aspect of banks, every aspect of banking is controlled through regulations. Right? You know, it, it, what banks can do and what they can do, who they can give loans to and who they can give loans to, who can own the stock of a bank and who cannot own the stock of a bank. Banks are regulated in every aspect. The same is true of Wall Street, of investment banks, of stock exchanges. People think that there's a Wild West free market in the financial sector. But that's a fantasy. The financial sector is heavily, heavily regulated. It, that doesn't matter to people, though. In spite of the fact that finance is in banking are probably the most regulated industries in the United States. When we had a financial crisis, not that long ago, you know, 10 years ago, well, no, 12 years ago, who was blamed for the financial crisis? I mean, before anybody actually had any evidence, before anybody had done any research, before anybody had any time to think about it, as soon as the financial crisis happened, immediately, the headlines were Wall Street to blame, Wall Street its fault, Wall Street speculation, Wall Street greed. Bankers caused this financial crisis. Bankers need to be punished for this financial crisis. And of course, not just bankers, but unregulated bankers 
Free markets were at fault. Capitalism was at fault. It was the system of supposedly unregulated cap, uh, finance that was at fault. But nobody stopped to think for a minute. But wait a minute. Banks are heavily, heavily regulated. Mortgages, which were part of the financial crisis, if you remember, heavily, heavily regulated. Housing, heavily, heavily regulated. Every one of the industries that actually caused the financial crisis 12 years ago was heavily regulated. Then what happened? Was it, was it bankers' fault or was it the regulations' fault? Was it the incentives of a free market or was it caused by the regulations, the distortions, the perversions that government control over finance creates? Now, I don't have time here to prove it to you, but if you want, there is a YouTube course. I, there's a course that I gave that's available on YouTube and on podcasting apps where I go for eight hours, go through all the causes of the financial crisis. And let's be clear, the financial crisis was not caused by free markets in banking. The financial crisis was not caused by greed. The financial crisis was not caused by finance. The financial crisis was caused by government policies, by bad regulations, by central banks screwing up and messing up. The financial crisis was caused by state intervention in financial markets. Now, why do we have so many regulations? Why is finance more regulated than any other business? And, and by the way, just to, one more point on the financial crisis. What was the solution to financial crisis? It was more regulations, more controls, more of the same thing that if you actually do an analysis, more of the same things that caused the crisis. That was what was presented as the solution. And the consequence of that is that we've had for the last 12 years, slow economic growth, financial industry that's boring, non-innovative, not very productive, hurting the economy instead of helping the economy. Now, why are bankers regulated to the extent that they are? Well, because we associate every problem with them. It's because we're afraid bankers, we view them as inherently deceptive, evil, scheming, greedy, goes back to Dante and Shakespeare. I mean, I used to teach a class a long time ago called finance and ethics. And a lot of people would say immediately, finance and ethics, that's a contradiction in terms. You can't have finance and ethics. But that's the problem. If you have that point of view, if you think that finance is inherently unethical, then what do you want to do to financiers? Well, you want to control them. You want to regulate them. You want to put a little regulator on the, on, the, uh, on the banker's shoulder to make sure that they don't behave in unethical ways. I used to ask my students in this class at the beginning of the semester, I said, okay, here's your assi an assignment. By the end of the semester, I want you to come to me with one movie or novel where financier is presented as the good guy. A positive portrayal of a financier, of a banker. And it was the hardest assignment they had all semester because they're very, very few. It's almost impossible to find it. But if I'd asked them to find a villain who was a banker or financier, for that matter, just a businessman, it would have been easy. You would have found them just like that. So we have a strong cultural bias against finance. Now, a lot of us want to be in finance because they make a lot of money, but I know a lot of bankers, a lot of financiers, that in spite of the fact that this is the work that they do, they're not proud of it. They apologize for it. They can't explain why it's good. They can't explain what they actually do. And they live in a sense with a sense of guilt and shame. And this is tragic because my view is that there is no more productive, no more valuable 
a profession than the profession of finance. Finance is what makes the rest of the economy function. Finance is what makes the rest of the economy function smoothly, efficiently, effectively. Finance is responsible for the allocation of the one thing that the economy needs in order to grow, in order to build, in order to employ more people, in order to create more wealth, in order to raise people's standard of living. And that is capital. And finance, a free financial market, is by far the only effective way of allocating capital across the economy. Now, we'll talk about why finance is productive in what sense, but I just want to note, historically, if we look at history, that there's never been a successful economy in terms of standard of living, quality of life that has not had at least semi-free financial markets. There is no example in all of human history of central planning of finance working, of government or bureaucratic allocation of capital as creating wealth, entrepreneurship, innovation, success. Wealth creation, the standard of living in the societies in which we live, depend on the ability of financial markets to allocate capital efficiently and productive to its best use. And indeed, not only that, but to deny capital for those businesses and those industries that are dying, that are unsuccessful, that in a sense need to die. You say, oh, I'm cool. An industry needs to die? How can an industry need to die? Well, think about, think about the industry of typewriters. I don't know if you know what typewriters are. We click on buttons and you know, prints on a piece of paper. Well, once you had word processing, typewriters needed to die. There was no use for them. And indeed, well before consumers understood the typewriters were going to die, financial markets understood this. So if somebody wanted to expand their typewriter factory and they went to the bank or they went to the stock market or they went to the bond market to try to raise capital to expand their typewriter company, the financial markets would tell them, no, we're not giving you capital. You are a dead industry. It would be a waste. It would be throwing money away. It would be destroying wealth to give you money. We're investing in computers. That indeed is the future. There is no progress without what Schumpeter, the great economist, called creative destruction, without some businesses going out of business, without whole industries going out of business, when they become obsolete, when alternatives that are far more productive, far more efficient, far better uh, are created. So financiers are responsible for this allocation of capital. I mean, think in the most simple sense, what a banker does. A banker takes in loan applications and decides who to give a loan to and who not to give a loan to. Now, that's a huge responsibility. And what's the basis on which he makes the decision? Well, he makes a decision about which business seems to be profitable, sustainable, which business he thinks will actually survive, exist in a few years. In other words, which business is likely to create wealth rather than destroy it? Which business is likely to employ people rather than lay them off? Which business can actually pay back its debts and which business will never pay back their debts? So, the banker is a crucial, crucial piece in determining what is successful and what fails. And the fact that he is motivated by the profit motive, the fact that he is motivated by making money, guarantees that he will already support businesses 
that will make money. And why is that important? Because if you make money, that's a sign that you're viable and sustainable. If you make money, that's a sign that you're creating wealth and you're creating value. Value for whom? Well, value for your customers, value for your employees, value for your suppliers, value for everybody in your supply chain. If you weren't creating value for them, they wouldn't deal with you and you wouldn't be a successful business. What the profit motive, what profit shows us is the, cre- it's, a, it's a sign, it's a um, measure of value creation. And what the bank is doing is he's guaranteeing, or not guaranteeing because he's still taking risk, he's trying to assess who is going to be a value creator and who's not. And therefore, by doing this, he is squeezing inefficiency, unproductiveness, wealth destruction out of the system and providing those that are going to create, build, make, create real values, providing them with the resources to grow and flourish. A banker does this every day, by which loans he chooses to fund and which loans and business plans he chooses not to fund. Stock market does this on a grander scale, but does exactly the same thing. Which stocks go to market? Which companies can raise large capital? Well, those, those you know, companies that the market, financiers within the market believe will be profitable in the future. They don't even have to be profitable right now. It's, it's interesting. Like a company like Amazon for years and years and years was not profitable. But he could still raise money. Why? Because clearly it was generating enough to pay off, to pay back its debts. And clearly there was a path to profitability that suggested that when they became profitable, they would be hugely profitable and therefore worth the investment. If pro- Amazon could never show a profit. It could, if it projected into the future and there was never going to be any profits, nobody would have provided it with capital. By the way, that's what happened. I don't know if you followed the story of WeWork. WeWork was this company. I mean, I'm sure you all know what WeWork is. It's these office spaces. And WeWork was about to go public a few months ago. And when people actually looked, when financiers actually looked at the numbers, what they discovered is not only was WeWork not profitable, Everybody kind of knew that. But what they discovered and kind of shocked them all was that WeWork had no path to profitability. There was no way for WeWork to become profitable. And as a consequence, nobody wanted to give them capital. If they had given them capital, that capital would have been wasted. It would have been destroyed it would have entailed wealth and value destruction. So the fact that the financiers withdraw their support of WeWork was a good thing because WeWork was never going to be profitable. That's what the numbers revealed once they tried to take this to Wall Street and to take it public. How it got that far is beyond me. Why did smart people keep giving them money in spite of the fact that they would never be profitable is beyond me. It is a failure of those people. But once financial markets actually got in, right? Actually got in. Then it was clear to them who, that they, these guys should not get money. On the other hand, think about Steve Jobs. Everybody knows who Steve Jobs is, I assume. When Steve Jobs was, uh, was starting Apple, he was a hippie. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of Steve Jobs from back then. He had long hair. He didn't believe in taking a shower. So he stunk, literally stunk. He was this hippie looking kid who'd never started a business and had really bad hygiene. And yet, he had a brilliant idea. And there was no question that he was brilliant. But think about the courage and the the conviction and the rationality of somebody being able to see beyond the way Steve Jobs looked 
and to identify the idea that he was pitching, the idea that he was trying to raise money off of, as important and good and profitable. And writing the young Steve Jobs a check for half a million dollars, which was the first check Steve Jobs got. And starting one of the most successful companies in all of human history, Apple. All because somebody could look beyond just the, the looks and actually evaluate an idea. That's great finance. That's a great financier. You look at the idea and you're willing to risk it. Now, for every 10 ideas that somebody like a venture capitalist invests in, seven go bankrupt, two do okay, and one is fantastic. But that's the kind of risk a venture capitalist is willing to take, that form of finance. A banker takes a lot less risk. Stock market take other types of risk. Financiers, financial markets, finance in general is this beautiful, beautiful system of allocating capital to its most productive use, efficiently, productively, by matching risk tolerance, really risky projects, people with a high risk tolerance invest in them, really, really safe projects, people with very low risk tolerance invest in them. They each earn a return, profit, if you will, based on how much risk they're willing to take. And doing this, you know, the allocation of capital that results from this, the productivity gains that result from this, the standard of living that results from this are magical, are magnificent. And you can see that in every advanced society in the world. You know, Hong Kong is a financial center. No accident. Singapore, lots of banks, lots of, again, a financial center. America has robust financial institutions in spite of all the regulations and controls. You know, fairly free and very robust. You know, Northern Europe, really good banking. London, a financial center. Again, there's a high correlation between the extent to which you have robust finance and the quality and standard of living within your society. China, in order to advance economically, ultimately had to adopt finance, financial principles. They had to start private banks, a stock market, real financial institutions, and free them up, let them make decisions, independent of politicians. So the most important function of finance, the thing that makes it crucial and essential for any kind of economy to be successful is its allocation of capital. But it's not just the allocation of capital that financiers contribute to all of our lives, contribute to an economy, contribute to a society. It is also the fact that by allocating the capital and by making money allocating the capital, they are not only making money for themselves, but they are making money for savers and investors. So think about what you would have to do. If you, let's say you had $10,000, I don't know, you inherited it, you, you, you worked hard and you, you, you saved it and you've got now $10,000. And you want to get a return on it. You want to get some kind of return on that money. Well, I mean, you could now go and spend your time interviewing 100 different businesses, trying to figure out which one to invest with. If once you made that investment, if you wanted to get the investment back, good luck. Somebody would have to buy it from you. You would have to go and market it. I mean, doing your own direct investing like that to get a return, to get profit is really, really hard and really, really, really risky. Because we have advanced financial markets and institutions, if you don't want to take a lot of risk, you can take your money and put it in the bank. They will pay you a low interest rate, but you'll get something. They will keep your money for you. They will give you an efficient way in which to spend it and accumulate it and, and, and save it. 
you know, a debit card, a credit card, checks. If you want to take on a little bit more risk, you can buy some bonds in a bond market. You can get an ETF. And if you want your money back in, from a bank or from the bond market, you just sell it immediately. You don't have to shop it around. You don't have to figure out who is interested in buying your investment. But if you want to take on more risk and get potentially a higher return, you can buy stocks. You can buy single company stocks. You can buy a diversified portfolio of stocks. You can buy an ETF. Again, with liquidity guaranteed. Let's say you don't value liquidity that much, the ability to go in and out of it. You could then go and buy a, 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 into a fund that does private equity or venture capital and where you lock your money up for a certain period of time. And you have all these choices and how you want to invest your money, each one of them, providing you with different levels of risk, different levels of return, different levels of liquidity, and you get to make a choice about how you want your money to be saved. In the old days, a long, long time ago, before there was real finance, if you had money, you would basically have it in gold or something like that, and you would stick it in the mattress and you would sleep on it. It could be easily stolen. Maybe you buried it somewhere. And it never, never gave you a return. It never made it possible for that money, in a sense, to grow. So you were never able to, you know, in a sense, invest that money in order to create more money so that one day you could retire and maybe live on the interest. That was unthinkable. You worked until you dropped dead. And if you saved, all your saving was money you put aside. The savings did not grow. Today, you can invest the money. Over many, many years, that money can grow dramatically and increase your amount of saving. And by the way, how does it grow dramatic, dramatically? The reason a bank can give you interest, the reason the stock market gives you a return, is because that money is used for productive purpose that provides profit, that grows the economy. So you are gaining twice. You're gaining once because you're getting a return on your investment. And you're gaining a second time because the economy is doing better. There are more jobs. There's more stuff. Your standard of living goes up because now there's Apple. Now there's an iPhone. Now there's the internet. Now there are things that the money you saved went into creating. And who sits at the center of all this? At the center of all this is other financiers who make all of that possible. So what is finance? Finance is that activity that makes it possible for you to save and to gain a return on your saving. And it uses that saving to invest in the real economy, to allocate that saving across the real economy, selecting those companies, those industries, those investments that are likely to benefit investors the most on a risk-return trade-off basis. There is no economic activity without this. Indeed, again, if you go back in history, when there was no finance, when there were no real sophisticated financial institutions, there was no economic growth. No economic growth. And if you look at countries with no banks, stock markets, bond markets, financial institutions, there is no economic growth. So in my view, finance is the most important profession in the world. If you care about economic success, if you care about economic growth, if you care about rising standard of livings, if you care about increased entrepreneurship, then you need a free, sophisticated, motivated financial markets and institutions. And it's no accident that people in finance make a lot of money. They make a lot of money because they create a lot of value. They create a lot of wealth. They oil, they make possible the machinery of an economy. Think about the economy as a body, a human body. Every cell in the body 
needs oxygen. It needs, it needs nutrients. How do they get those nutrients? They get it through the blood, through the system of arteries and veins and heart. That is finance. Finance is the heart of capitalism, the heart of an economy. The arteries, the veins, all the different financial instruments and institutions that exist, that allocate, that provide the capital to those cells, the capital that every business out there needs in order to survive. And without business, there are no employees. Without business, there's no wealth. Without business, there are no products. Without business, there's no economic success. Without business, we die. There are way too many people on the planet if we don't have business and we don't have finance. So there is a question then of why then, if finance is so crucial, why then, if finance is so important and so beneficial to human life, why have people looked down on it? Why have they viewed financiers as villains? Why have they always treated financiers badly? And I would say there are basically two causes. Two causes. The first is that people are ignorant of economics. They know very little about how business works, how an economy works, and they don't really understand what financiers do. They view them as paper shufflers. Because what they do is very abstract. If you think about a regular businessman, let's say they produce a product, people still resent them because they make money, and we'll get to that in a minute. But, but generally, people understand that this business creates these products, and I need these products. Therefore, I need to at very least tolerate the business. But with finance, what is the product they create? Well, I would argue they make possible every product. But that's an abstraction. That's hard for people to comprehend. Financiers can't hide behind a product. They can't hide behind something that benefits you directly. They have, you have to actually think about how finance benefits your life. Financiers could explain it. If they, you know, that, would be, that would be good if they did, if they tried, but they don't. But you would still have to think about it. It requires thought. It requires conceptualization. It is hard. It's not obvious perceptually. I can't see what financiers do. I can see what manufacturers do. I can see what a restaurant does. What I can't see is that the restaurant and the manufacturing plant wouldn't exist without a financier having funded them. So reason number one is just straight ignorance. But reason number two is that people resent the profit motive. I, I know this is true in Mexico, where you are, where you are uh, flirting with socialism. But this is true all over the world, including in America. We don't like profits. We resent businessmen generally. We think profit somehow is immoral. We have a morality. We have a morality that tells us that what's good, what's noble, what's virtuous is not making money. It's not profit. It's sacrifice. It's living for others. It's being humble and, 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 and being, being, you know, living a simple life. That morality, virtue, nobility is not about profit but about the rejection of money and material goods. It's about suffering and sacrifice. Our moral ethical heroes are not Steve Jobs and, and Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates. They're Mother Teresa. Now, who helped poor people more, Bill Gates or Mother Teresa? Well, it's not a competition. Bill Gates helped billions of people, made the lives of billions of people better. He created jobs for millions and millions and millions of people, created whole industries. And even the aid that some very poor people get is efficiently delivered to them 
through supply chains that are run on computers that are possible only because of Bill Gates and Microsoft. So if the standard was who has benefited humanity more, well, financiers and businessmen should be our heroes, our moral heroes. But it's not. That's not the standard. The standard is not who benefited society the most, who benefited the world the most. The standard is who sacrificed the most, who didn't benefit the most, who was selfless the most. That is a morality of death. It's a morality of destruction. And it's a morality that is going to be anti-capitalism, anti-markets, anti-business, and anti-financiers. It should be rejected because I think it's anti-life. A proper morality is a morality that says that your life is yours. To be enjoyed, to be lived rationally in pursuit of your rational long-term self-interest. A morality that says that profit is beautiful. Profit is amazing because profit represents value creation. Value for whom? For yourself and for other people. Why is profit represent value for other people? Well, think about the iPhone. I paid $1,000 for the iPhone. How much was that iPhone worth to me if I paid $1,000 for it? Well, it's worth more than $1,000 to me if I paid $1,000. I wouldn't have bothered if it was worth less. I think the iPhone makes my life better by more than $1,000. Indeed, I think the iPhone is worth tens of thousands of dollars to me, given the utility I get from it, the value I get from it. So am I better off or worse off for having paid $1,000 for the iPhone? I'm much better off. I got something more valuable for something less valuable. Is Apple better off or less? Apple is also better off. It's a win-win transaction. And Apple's profit symbolizes, symbolizes the value it has created for me. Indeed, it's just a fraction of the value it created for me. So when I see companies making a lot of money, I go, yes. In a free market, right? They're not stealing, they're not lying, they're not cheating. Assume that. I go, yes, I, I, I celebrate. Because that's a sign they've created a lot of value for a lot of people. The fact that Bill Gates is worth, I don't know, $70 billion means he created trillions of dollars of wealth, of, of, of uh, improved quality of life for billions of people. You cannot become a billionaire in a free market, without improving the world around you, without making the lives of many, many, many people better. So to me, profit is a virtue. It's a sign of productivity. It's a sign of value creation. It's a sign that somebody is working hard to make my and other people's lives better. That might not be their motivation. Their motivation might be fun. Their motivation might be money. But the fact is that they're making my life better. And that's how I look at financiers. Financiers, in my view, are noble. It's a noble profession. It's a virtuous profession. It's a profession that is in many times heroic, given how much financiers are attacked. It is an activity that is necessary for economic success, for economic growth, for economic flourishing. Entrepreneurs cannot build their businesses unless financiers fund them. Businesses cannot grow unless financiers fund those businesses. And industries cannot die unless financiers stop funding them. And that's important too. That's how progress is created. So rather than being this profession that everybody looks down on, that everybody condemns, that everybody ridicules. A proper approach to finance is that it is a heroic, moral, virtuous profession. It requires individuals to use their mind in an effort to create a better world around them, to create value, and to, 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 to produce or to make it possible 
for other producers to produce. So we should celebrate finance. Finance indeed is noble, it's productive, and their pursuit of profit is virtuous. Thanks, and I'll, I'll take questions. I see we've got a bunch of questions in the Q&A already. Thank you so much, Mr. Brook. Would you like me to read the questions or? Only if they're in Spanish, then I'll need you to translate, but these look like they're in English. Oh, so yeah. I... All right. So, so why is Mexico financial, uh, why in Mexico financial education, financial regulation, financial goals, etc., is just part of conversations, but educational system being that important? It's about Fed system or just our government ways. I'm not sure I understand the question. Maybe a role can rephrase it. Yes. Raúl Ángel Carrillo, ¿crees que puedas volver a escribir la pregunta, por favor? ¿Cómo a qué te refieres? He will rewrite the question. Okay, so let me go to the next one, Ramon's question. A pretty interesting perspective um, that the financial sector decide, uh, no, pretty interesting perspective about how the world sees bankers and the financial sector in general. Okay, thank you. Glad you, glad it was interesting. Considering the fact that the financial sector decides whom they'll give money to, not depending on how viable they see it, what professions will disappear and which ones do you think will prosper in the next couple of years. Wow. I mean, next couple of years. I mean, I think that is going to really depend on how people, um, how people's behavior is going to change coming out of this coronavirus uh, situation. So, uh, for example, I I'd be very, very weary of owning airline stocks or, or hotel stocks or restaurant stocks, because I think it's going to be a long time before people are ready to go back to flying and go to restaurants and go to hotels. And it's, it's going to be difficult to own those stocks. So uh, you want to look at industries where, you know, industries where people can work from home are very viable industries in this new world we've created, right? Um, as compared to industries where you have to go to a physical location and work in a particular physical location. Also, uh, so consumer demand is going to shift because of the crisis. And the challenge is going to be predicting those shifts. That's what's going to make you a good investor versus a mediocre investor. And I think financial markets are already starting to do that. First of all, you saw it in the fact that um, airplane stocks declined, hotel stocks declined. But tech stocks, Amazon, for example, stocks of companies where people worked at home, Zoom, which we're using, those stocks went through the roof. Why? Because those companies are viable. Those companies are going to grow. Those companies should receive more capital because they are viable in this new world we are moving into where our behavior is going to be limited by this virus. Uh, so the market is always ahead, right? Uh, I think before we all sat down and thought, huh, how is this virus going to affect people? The stock market was already doing it. That is, the financiers were already thinking about it. They're already implementing it. And that was already reflected in the prices. And this goes to my idea earlier that financiers are the first to know which businesses are dead, which businesses should grow. Um, even before, certainly before politicians or before intellectuals or professors or even people like me, right? People in the market have their money at stake, are incentivized and motivated to do the best job that they can to figure all that out. So I think if you follow markets, you'll be able to tell which professions are going to disappear and which are not, because those professions where the stock price is going down versus those that are going up or what the market is predicting are going to be successful versus not successful in the future. But that's true across the board, banks and so on. Uh, but it's, it's a really, you know, to some extent, it's a hard question right now because we don't yet know completely how people's behaviors are going to change post-crisis. All right, how can we rethink business and finance? And by doing so, start doing valued-centered entrepreneurship. 
I think the main thing we need to do about rethinking business as finance is get rid of the guilt associated with it and recognize the true virtue that it constitutes. We need to start thinking of, of business people, entrepreneurs and financiers, as the heroes of our society, as the good guys, and engage in policies that free them up. The problem in all our economies, in all our countries, is that there are too many controls, too much regulation, too many attempts by government to centrally plan, too many attempts to control, regulate it, and, and determine how markets should work. What we should really be doing is deregulating, reducing controls, getting the government to stop centrally planning, and let markets and entrepreneurs and business people and financiers actually work. Let the profit motive actually function, because when it does function, again, it leads to the highest standard of living, the best quality of life. So I think capitalism, freedom, elimination of regulation, is the way we need to start rethinking about this. And to do that, we have to change our attitude towards business. We have to stop thinking that self-interest is a bad thing, that, that making money is a bad thing. We need to view the profit motive as a sign of virtue, not a vice. Okay, uh, Cesar asks, I'm agreeing with we hate capitalism more than we love socialism, but... Acting in rational self-interest would really lead to greatest global well-being under a capitalist system because we have so many times when selfish agents are motivated to produce long-term harm for short-term gain, such as in the instance of climate change, could lead to green swan, swan, a green swan, like a, I guess like a black swan. I don't think that that is true. That is, I don't think that businessmen are focused on short-term gain and sacrificing the long-term. Because the fact is that businessmen are the most long-term thinkers in the world in which we live. If you think about who thinks long-term, for example, who thinks about new medication and the 10, 20 years it'll take to develop new medication? It's drug companies, it's biotech companies, it's, it's entrepreneurs, it's business. Who thinks about building new energy plants and creating new energy sources over a long period of time? It's businessmen. Now, we don't let them because we regulate that. For example, if you're concerned about climate change, and I am not particularly concerned about climate change. I, I, I think it's a solvable problem, so I'm not very concerned about it. But if you're concerned about climate change, then you should be very pro-nuclear. And what you should be doing, because nuclear is the cleanest, safest form of energy known to us. It's incredibly safe, and it emits no CO2, and it's incredibly clean. There's no pollution. Even the waste now with new nuclear power plants is minimal and sometimes infinitesimal because the nuclear power plant can actually recycle its own waste. So just let entrepreneurs build nuclear power plants. But no, we don't trust them. We don't believe in them. So we regulate the hell out of it and cause it to be so expensive that they can't do it. But if you actually provided the long-term incentive, the long-term incentive is profit, then selfish agents, let me put it this way, being selfish, properly selfish, caring about oneself, is not about a short term. It's about the long term. What's the point in being successful short-term if I'm going to fail long-term? If you lie, steal, or cheat, is that a good long-term strategy for life? No. You're probably going to get caught. But even if you don't get caught, it's just spiritually draining, exhausting, and, and, and just bad. It's not a good way to live your life. It's a rejection of the one tool you have to live a good life, which is your mind. So people who are properly selfish and business people do not 
put the short term above the long term. And there's no evidence that they do in a free market. Now, I will argue this, and I see this all the time. Government places more emphasis on the short term than the long term. Why? Because government is on a four-year election cycle. All they care about is, is doing okay for the next four years, and then there's an election, and then another four years, and then they're gone in America. Or if they're, in the, if they're, if they're a member of parliament, that they, all they care about is the next election. They don't care about the long term. I don't know any politician who cares about the long term. I don't know any politician, partially because the quality of politicians, that can think long term. Businessmen are thinkers. Politicians are not thinkers. They're manipulators. They're emotors. So the only people in our culture who properly think long-term are are businessmen, self-interested businessmen. It's you. You're going to be the future businessman. Why would you try to make short-term profits if long-term it's going to hurt your business? Or if it's long-term it's going to hurt... The, 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 let's say the air that your children breathe. I mean, the fact is that capitalist countries are the cleanest countries. Socialism creates filth more than anything else. I don't, I've, I've lived under socialism. Israel was socialist when I lived there. And of course, when the Berlin Wall came down and people went into Eastern Europe, which had experienced ca- communism, it was filthy. The environment was disgusting. And actually, when you go to West Berlin versus East Berlin, East Berlin was filthy, West Berlin was clean. In capitalism, we respect private property. And you clean your private property. When something is yours, you take care of it. When something's not yours, it's the public's. Then you don't take care of it. You you don't care about it. About uh, Humberto asks, do you usually invest in Mexican companies? I do not. Uh, I, I don't invest in things I don't understand. And I don't know Mexico. I don't understand. I mean, I've been to Mexico, obviously. But I don't understand the business environment. I don't understand the political environment. I don't understand uh, a lot about Mexican companies. So I, I wouldn't invest in them. Now, I do invest in kind of an, uh, a global portfolio. And I'm sure like a, um, a diversified global portfolio. And I'm sure as part of that diversified global portfolio, there's some Mexican companies in it. But I do not try to make assessments about this is a good Mexican company, this is a bad one, because it's not my area of expertise. I, I trust other financiers who that is their area of expertise. Generally in investing, I encourage you to invest in what you understand, in what you know, and, and what, you, what you're motivated to know. I mean, you can learn stuff. I could immerse myself in Mexico and learn how to evaluate Mexican companies. It's just not where my interests lie. I, I, I do other stuff. All right. Uh, Ramon asks, Mexico currently counts with two stock exchanges, the Mexican Stock Exchange and BIVA. After the Brazilian Stock Exchange, the Mexican Stock Exchange is the largest stock exchange in Latin America and the fifth largest in the Americas. Nonetheless, the Mexican stock exchange is far from being as relevant as the largest stock exchange in the world. My question is, what does the Mexican stock exchange do you think need in order to reach the level of importance? And do you think it will ever reach that level of relevance in the future? I mean, I think it can, but it's not just about what the Mexican stock exchange does. It's about what the entire Mexican economy does. So, you know, the United States, the, the New York Stock Exchange is, is the biggest in the world and uh, because the American economy is the biggest in the world. It, and because the American economy has been for a long time one of the, if not the most vibrant economies in the world. So what you need in Mexico is to completely reform your economy. You need to make Mexico a vibrant economy, an economy that needs and justifies a significant stock exchange. Now, doing that is not that hard economically, but it's impossible, almost impossible politically and culturally because most people hate capitalism, but that's what's needed. So what the Mexican economy needs is more capitalism. What you need is greater respect for property rights. 
What you need is property right reform, land reform, but property right reform. You need a rule of law in ways that you don't have in Mexico. You need to get the government out of every sector of your economy, starting with the energy sector. There was some attempts with the previous administration to privatize your energy sector. But you need a lot more. The Mexican energy sector needs to be completely 100% privatized. And then every sector needs to be privatized. And as part of that, the land in Mexico needs to be privatized. All that land that today is owned by the government, which is the majority, I think, of the land in Mexico, should be given to private people. It's one way to deal with poverty. Take all the poor people in Mexico and give them land for free. That would give them capital. It would give them something they can mortgage. It would give them something they own. It would change the dynamics. So what you want to do is change Mexico from a mixed economy, a, uh, an economy in which uh, there's a lot of cronyism, where businessmen have a lot of pull with the government, an economy that is moving towards socialism, an economy in which the government controls many aspects of business, where, again, the government has its businessmen and controls them and they control the government and it goes both ways. What you need is to get rid of all of that. What you need is true freedom. What you need is true capitalism. What you need is to get rid of the government regulations, government control, government manipulation of your economy and create a true laissez-faire economy. And if you did that and you deregulated your financial markets at the same time, you freed them up, yeah, there's absolutely zero reason why Mexico cannot have the biggest, most thriving stock exchange in the Americas. Because America, in many respects, is on the decline. It's on the decline because it's become a place of fear. It's afraid of trade. It's afraid of immigrants. It's afraid of viruses. It's, 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 it's become a country filled with fear. And, and to address the fear, people run to government for more help and more help and more controls and more regulation. So the United States of America is slipping away from freedom, away from capitalism, away from wealth creation. And somebody, hopefully, will fill in the void of being a dynamic, exciting, free, capitalist economy in the world. There's no reason that can't be Mexico other than ideas. You're going to have to convince people. You're going to have to make dramatic, revolutionary changes to your economy in order to take that leadership position away from the United States. But the United States is, is, is in decline. There's no question about that. How can we exchange this morality of sacrifice and reject a profit to a morality of creating value and wealth? Well, first, I would suggest reading. I would suggest reading Ayn Rand. Uh, Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged, um, Fountainhead. She's got a book called The Virtue of Selfishness, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. And all of these books, every single one of them is available in Spanish. So it's no excuse. You don't have the language as an excuse. In, in new modern translations. So they're all available in good translations. There's a ton of, of Ayn Rand material online. So the first change one has to make is in yourself. You have to understand why the morality of sacrifice is wrong, bad for you, and bad for the world. And then you have to understand that there is an alternative because you need morality. We can't reject morality. You have to have a morality. But you need a morality of creating value and wealth. And for that, you need to educate yourself about morality. And, and the best way to do that is to read Ayn Rand because she actually presents an alternative. Uh, an alternative consistent with wealth creation, an alternative consistent with creating values and, 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 and consistent with finance, consistent with business and entrepreneurship. Many of, of the great entrepreneurs of the last 50 years in America were inspired by Ayn Rand. They didn't necessarily accept all of her ideas, but they certainly were inspired by her. So I would definitely recommend that the way we change the morality is we adopt a new one, 
and to adopt a new one, one has to one has to educate oneself in a new one, and that means reading Ayn Rand, educating yourself in Ayn Rand, you know, really, and then trying to influence your friends, your family, your professors, the, the students around you. So, change comes from education. We're not going to have any change unless we change the way people think about morality. What we need is a moral revolution, but that can only happen. That can only happen through education, 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 education. Anna asks, I agree with you that business and investment are crucial for economics and job creation. But what would you say about investing money when there is a worldwide tendency to socialism? <laughs> I'd say it's dangerous and risky. I'd say we live in very risky times. And this is, and you're right, it's a worldwide tendency towards socialism. And what does socialism do? They nationalize. They take that money away. They, they confiscate private property. They socialize. So there is an argument to be made that if the world is going towards socialism, you should bury your money. You should hide your money. You should protect it rather than invest it. I'm not that pessimistic yet. I still think there are opportunities to invest. I don't think we're heading um, to socialism tomorrow. I also think we all need to fight the trend against socialism. And the other thing is we need to find places in the world where there's still some freedom. You know, that might be in Singapore, Hong Kong. It might be, I don't know. I, I thought at some point maybe Brazil was heading towards more freedom, but this president, they have Bolsonaro, is such an idiot that I think he's going to completely blow it, screw it up completely. But you got to find those places in the world that are not heading towards socialism, those places in the world where you could still make good investments and still create and still produce and invest over there. Um, it's, it's becoming harder and harder, but your generation's fight is going to be how to eliminate this threat of socialism, how to fight against it and change the tide of history, change the direction of where we're heading. Um, Diego asked, don't you think the last crisis in 2008 had something to do with avarice? I mean, the, even with some evidence of banks being colliding with security regulate, regulatory agencies and colluding with security rating agencies in order to create a sense of false wellness in the market, which ended, which ended creating a bubble. I mean, there's a sense in which that's true. However, that kind of environment could never have happened in a free market. The only reason they could have so-called colluded was because they were protected by government and regulators. I'll give you a few examples. So big banks in America before 2008 had something called too big to fail. So they knew that if they failed, the government would bail them out. That's called moral hazard. It means that if they make a lot of money, they get to keep it. And if they lose money, the government will bail them out. So that gives them an incentive, a rational incentive to take on a lot of risk, which they did. And when the risk turns bad, which risk does, they walk away and the government bails everything out. And in the meantime, they got to pocket the money. Now, whose fault is that? It's not the fault of the financier who's just doing what the government has incentivized him to do. And if he doesn't do it, his competitors will. It's the fault of the government for setting up, in a sense, the game that way. In a free market, in capitalism, there's no such thing as too big to fail. If you take on too much risk and you fail, you lose everything. You get crushed. And that provides you with an incentive not to take on stupid risk, to moderate the risk, to be responsible, to be rational, to think long term. So the fault lies with government with regulations, with controls, not with the financiers. I'll give you one other example. You mentioned rating agencies. If you look at America's rating agencies, there are only three of them. 
And I, and I grant you, the rating agencies were terrible. They had these bonds rated at AAA, like weeks before they went to junk, to zero. They were terrible. All three of them. You have to ask yourself, why are there only three rating agencies? And why, if they're so bad, do they continue to exist? Because one thing we know about markets and capitalism is if you produce a bad product, you produce a bad service, you go out of business. Why haven't the agencies gone out of business? They're still not out of business. They still exist, even though they completely screwed up in 2008. Well, it turns out that there are only three rating agencies because the SEC, the American Regulatory Agency, only allows three. If you want to start a competitor, you need to get approval from the SEC, and the SEC has not approved any competitors. So we're stuck with three. So even though these rating agencies have, have been terrible at assigning ratings, and I could go back to the early 90s when they were terrible. So it's not new that they're terrible. They've been terrible forever. There's no other game in town because the regulators won't allow it. So there's no competitive market. So why, you might ask, why does anybody pay attention to the rating agencies if everybody knows what they do is crap? That would be a good question. And that's because, by law, certain institutions can only buy securities that are rated by these three agencies. Pension plans, insurance companies, and certain other institutions can only invest in rated securities, rated by these three, which provides them a market because government said so, not because the market dictated this. So none of the behavior that you saw before 2008 could happen in a free market, would happen in a free market. So you have to conclude that the reason the 2008 crisis happened is because the way government set up the regulations, set up the incentives, set up the controls. Of course, none of it would have happened if not for a central bank that manipulates interest rates, manipulates the money supply, and has no clue what it's doing and what is going on. And you're seeing that right now, right now with the Federal Reserve, I'm sure with the Mexican Central Bank, they're doing things that will jeopardize economic growth in these countries for decades to come. Aldo asks, what strat which strategy should we take such that people can trust on the financial system, financial institutions and financial activities like investing? Well, who is we, right? So my view is the best thing the government can do or voters can do is to get rid of regulations, get rid of controls, and let markets work. And I think, and, and, and express the extent to which we have confidence in business, in finance, and financial activity. Now, that doesn't mean that people will only make money when they invest. It doesn't mean that a bank doesn't go bankrupt once in a while. They do. Businesses go bankrupt. Businesses make mistakes. Businesses do badly. But we have to accept that as part of the risk of living in a free society. So we have to educate people about finance, about the system, about how it functions, about the value it creates for everybody. We have to educate our politicians on how to get out of the way so that markets can work function properly, effectively, efficiently, so that all of us can benefit to the maximum from efficient, productive, functioning financial markets. Like everything in life, nothing's easy. And changing the world is certainly not easy. It's about educating, it's about educating people and, and, and uh, convincing them of the truth of your position. There's no gimmick. There's no one thing that will just make everything change the way you want it to change. All right. Uh, Andrea, until what time do you want us to keep going? I guess we've got four questions. I could do these.
Yes, uh, we have like five, ten more minutes. Okay, let me do the try to do these four questions. So, so everybody, oh, we answer all of them. Um, how virtual money and financial movements through internet will affect regulations in countries' economies? I mean, that's a great question because one of the one of the things that regulators and governments are afraid of uh, Bitcoin and and other cryptocurrencies and and uh, and the internet is that they lose control that they can't control it as easily because it's encrypted, because it's secret, because it's anonymous. But I think that's great that it's secret and anonymous because it might force governments to realize that they cannot control us. Maybe they shouldn't control us. And maybe it'll be an impetus for actually seeing a freeing up of financial markets, a freeing up of our lives, and the government stepping away from trying to control everything and regulate everything. So we'll see. I think that is the one potential about the internet that it, we convince politicians they can't keep up with it. They, 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 they can't really control our lives because much of our lives cannot be moved into an encrypted space that they can't see and can't control. Uh, what do you think about the perspective of the actual president of Mexico who blames the enterprises and the financial institutions for the economic problems we have? And also, what do you think about economic support about, from the government gives to the people who need it? Is it an investment or waste? So I think, you're, I think you have a terrible president. I, I, I think his, his views are wrong, fundamentally wrong in every, almost every aspect. I think politicians always blame financiers because they know – it's easy to blame financiers, and the people usually support them when they blame financiers. Of course, I can tell you without question that the economic problems in that Mexico has experienced are all caused by the government, are all caused by bureau bureaucrats, are all caused by politicians, and primarily caused by the president himself and the fact that he is maintaining and supporting the system that exists today. What Mexico needs is a complete economic revolution. So you have to flip it on him. No, it's his fault. It's not businessmen and financial markets fault. The opposite. The only solution to poverty in Mexico is freer financial markets and freer financial institutions. Do I think welfare support of poor people is investment or waste? I think at the end of the day, it is a waste, but you can't just eliminate it tomorrow. You have to first create a thriving um, uh, active job market, business environment, so that people have an option, so that people can find work. First, you should privatize the land in Mexico and get poor people to own that piece of land. First, you have to free up businesses to, to, to build and create and, and create those values and jobs so that people have an option to go to work rather than accept a welfare check. And if you create a vibrant economy in Mexico, then start withdrawing the welfare, make it go to zero. But the first step is to withdraw the welfare from businessmen. Get rid of the cronyism, get rid of the, of the, of the goodies that government gives businessmen. Then free up the economy to real competition. Then free up the economy to, to, to real property rights, to real capitalism. And then, only then, get rid of welfare, if you want. Uh, Mario, Mauro says, still money is king. No, money is not king. Uh, what king is, is our ideas. Ideas shape the world. Ideas shape history. The ideas you have will dictate whether you can use money well or use money badly. The ideas you have will, will determine whether you use money to support your life or use money to destroy your life. What is king is what's inside your head. And if you cultivate your mind, if you have good ideas, you can make a lot of money. But it's also an art to know how to spend the money, how to invest the money how to use the money. I know a lot of rich people, a lot of rich people who are unbelievably unhappy that have horrible lives. It's not the money that makes you happy. You need money to be happy, but it's not the money that makes you happy. Would letting all the financial agents without any regulation lead to corruption, stealing, fraud, or something similar? No. Markets are much better at regulating than our bureaucrats. And I'll add to that. Fraud, stealing have always been illegal, always, and should be illegal. If you took the police 
if you took the regulatory agencies and told them, no more regulations, but the one thing you have to do is catch the crooks, catch the, the fraudsters, the people who steal, the people who destroy, just those people. Forget everybody else. Forget the regulations. Just catch the fraudsters. It would be much easier for them. Be much less for them to do. And I think you'd have much, much cleaner. I would argue the opposite. The more regulations they have, the more controls you have, the more the market feels, quote, safe because the politicians and the regulators are supervising, the more corruption, the more stealing, the more fraud there is. So it works actually in reverse. Okay, last question. Maybe U.S. economy is in decline due to the economic system and the apply in excess of capitalism. No, the opposite. Too little capitalism. America has been moving away from capitalism for 100 years. The government spending grows every single year. More regulations every single year. It doesn't matter if Democrats are there or Republicans are there. The American economy, every economy that abandons capitalism, every economy that abandons capitalism declines. Uh, the privatized healthcare system doesn't provide health services for everyone. Not true. The, the American system is not a private healthcare system. Over 50% of healthcare in the United States is provided by government. And the private sector is the best healthcare system in the world. You get better service, better quality healthcare than anywhere in the world. So, no, the problem with the American healthcare system is it's not private enough. It's not capitalist enough. You know, 70% of all healthcare innovation in the world are produced by the United States. Why? Because it still has a little bit of freedom. Imagine if it had a lot. So no, the decline in America is for too little capitalism, too much government involvement. The problems of the American healthcare system is too much government, too many regulations, too many controls. And if you are sick, you would much rather be sick in America than in Mexico or in Germany or in Sweden or in Israel, where I come from. The best healthcare in the world you will get here. Now, you have to have insurance. But insurance is not that expensive, and it would be a lot cheaper, again, if we got rid of the controls, the regulations, the, 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 the involvement. It all boils down to capitalism works. It really does. And any attempt of socialism, whether small or big, is wealth destroying. Freedom works. It always has, always will. And you got to overcome the resistance to it if you want to be successful. The reason Mexico is poorer than America is only because Mexico has been less free than America. Mexico has respected economic rights, property rights, less than America has. That's the reason Mexico is poorer than America, nothing else. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think our time's up. Is that right, Andrea? Yes. Good. I think we covered all the questions. Yeah, thank you so much for speaking at our virtual financial summit. We really appreciate for you taking the time and effort to share your thoughts and points of view with us. And with no doubt, I am sure that your contribution will help to the preparation of all the young talents around here. Thank you so That's much. Great. It's, it's a pleasure. And I hope to see you all in Mexico one day soon. Of Thanks, course. everybody. Yeah, thank you.